Mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell. If you type that title into Google Trends, you'll notice that it's gone viral over the last few years. And that's because of memes like this. What are taxes and how do I pay them? School system says, worry not, mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. So it speaks to the trivial nature of information like this, that you took biology and it's the only thing that you can remember. Now, I would argue that that might be trivia, but understanding where the energy comes from in a mitochondria is difficult. And I'm gonna to try to cover that in this video, but ironically, over those last two years, the mitochondria has become more and more important in showing us not only where energy comes from, but where we come from. So here's a typical picture of a cell. Here'd be the mitochondria right there and there. Um, there's a lot of inaccuracies in this picture. There are not just two, but thousands of mitochondria in each cell. But if we look at the role of the mitochondria, it's to convert our nutrients, convert food into carbon dioxide and water, but more importantly, to release energy in the form of ATP. Now, energy just doesn't come from nowhere. It's neither created nor destroyed. So where was it before it was in the ATP? Well, the energy was in the nutrient. It's in the glucose. Itself. More specifically, it's in the bonds between the hydrogen and the carbon in the glucose. So those are high energy bonds, and so there are going to be high energy electrons between the hydrogen and the carbon, and we can use those, and we will use those later in this video. So the glucose is outside the mitochondria in the cytoplasm, or inside the cell itself. We've got two membranes, an outer and an inner, with an inner membrane space between the two. And then if we go all the way to the inside of the mitochondria, we're going to have the matrix. Now there's some interesting things here. Uh, mitochondria have their own DNA, um, they have their own ribosomes, and those will come pl into play a little bit later in the video. And so at the biggest picture, what happens to nutrients is that they're broken down. So the process of glycolysis releases a little bit of ATP, but a lot of those chemicals are moving forward into the Krebs cycle where we release a little bit more ATP, and then eventually we go to the electron transport chain. The thing I want you to understand is this is where all of that ATP is released. That's the most interesting part of cellular respiration. If we think about the energy in glucose, we can represent it on an energy diagram. These are really simple. Basically, if it's high on this free energy diagram, it means that it has energy, available energy that we can utilize. We can release that during a reaction. Easiest way to do that with glucose is to simply burn it. If you just burn glucose on a uh, fire, you're going to release a huge amount of energy, energy in those high energy electrons. Now in the mitochondria, it's a little more complex than that. We have a series of steps and a series of drops. Every time we go up, we're storing energy in the molecules. Every time we drop, we're releasing that energy. To orient ourselves, everything on the left side would be during glycolysis, and on the right side is the Krebs cycle. So if we look at the actual ATP, we put a little bit of ATP in, we're going to get a little bit of ATP out. But if you look at it, with each of these big drops, we're storing that energy in a molecule that for the most part is called NADH. And so we're storing high energy electrons in that molecule. Where is it all headed? It's all headed to the electron transport chain. So let's go there. So where are we at? We're on the inner membrane. So this would be the matrix down here. So this is all the way on the inside of the mitochondria. So if we break it apart, we're all the way in here. And that's why it's really important this membrane has high surface area because we, we really want to increase the amount of energy that we can make. There are a few other things in play. We have a series of proteins here. These big ones are going to be stationary. This is the most famous one, ATP synthase. And then we have some carrier proteins as well. Um, a few other things at play, we're going to have the oxygen that you breathe in, and then we've got that hydrogen again. This time it's a hydrogen ion, so that means it's lost its electrons. If I were to say, point here where the energy is, where you should point is going to be at these molecules right here. So it's going to be in these high energy molecules that came from the food. But watch what happens as we go through the electron transport chain. As those electrons move through these complexes and, and move across, every time they move through one of these large protein complexes, What's it doing? It's pumping one of these protons out of the matrix and into that inner membrane space. Now we have to do this again to complete the set. So we've got electrons coming in, they're moving across. Notice as they move through, it's like a drop after a drop after a drop in energy. We're using that energy to pump those protons, the hydrogen ions, outside the matrix into that inner membrane space. And so when we're done, we've got the electrons here. Now where are they going to go? they're going to move to the oxygen that we take in when we breathe. And what does that create? That creates water. Now, if I were to say at this point, where is the energy on this diagram? We don't have the electrons anymore. So where did the energy go? The energy went into pumping those protons outside of that uh, matrix.
And so how do we get that energy back? Well, if you think about this, these are all up here positive charges. And they're surrounded by other positive charges. The only way they can get out of there is to go through this ATP synthase. Watch what happens as they move through. We generate ATP. So every time one of those protons comes back in, we're making more ATP. And so you can see that this is where the energy comes from. Now, how do we keep this going? We have to have more food and we have to have more oxygen and the mitochondria itself. But as long as we have those things, we can generate a huge amount of energy. How much energy? It's been calculated that we can generate as much energy per square meter as is in a lightning bolt. So a huge amount of energy. So this is how magical the mitochondria is. We've got this membrane on the inside that's generating a huge amount of ATP. The nice thing is we have its own little DNA, its own little genome inside the mitochondria. What are the genes on that DNA? They're simply genes that can make these protein complexes out here. So we've got a way to generate a huge amount of electricity. And since that DNA is right there, we can regulate the amount of those proteins and therefore regulate the amount of energy as well. So the mitochondria can generate a huge amount of energy, but what does it tell us about the history of life on our planet? Well, the Earth was created 4.6 billion years ago. We then had water, simple prokaryotic life, eventually eukaryotic life, and then we had multicellular animals, plants, things like that. But there have been two big mysteries about the history on our planet. Number one is how did we go from prokaryotic life so microscopic life to eukaryotic life, these complex cells. Well, this was kind of unlocked by uh, scientist Lynn Margulis. She put forward this idea of endosymbiosis. So if we go back in here through time with that first eukaryotic cell, we had two prokaryotic cells. We now know that there was one archaebacteria and then one bacteria. They were living next to each other and one took in the other. But instead of destroying it, it lived inside it and it became the mitochondria. In fact, that's the mitochondria that's in all eukaryotic cells, including yours, on the planet. Now, what's the other mystery is why did it take so long for that to occur? Why did it take so long to go to eukaryotic cells? It took billions of years to get to that point. And after that, then we got all of this complexity. Well, ideas on this have been put forward in the last few years. The biggest one comes from scientists Nick Lane and, Will, and Bill Martin. And what they said is it has to do with the energy and the energy created in the mitochondria itself. So if we look at these two types of cells, eukaryotic and prokaryotic, lots of times they're placed on the same image like this, but you don't get a sense of scale. Let me show you what a typical eukaryotic cell looks like in relation to a prokaryotic cell. So they're really, really small. And so how did we go from these very simple, very small cells to these complex cells? Well, you're going to have to grow. And to grow, you're going to have to make more proteins. That's where all of the energy is going, is going into making of these proteins. But if you just double your size, you're going to have to make twice as much energy. Now, these prokaryotic cells don't have a mitochondria. How are they making their energy? On their own membrane. But they have to do other things with their genome. They have to make proteins. They have to make the cell itself. And so by us getting cells inside our cells, these mitochondria, what they were able to do is generate energy for the cell. Again, there are going to be thousands of these mitochondria within the cell. What's nice is the nucleus can focus on making the proteins for the cell. What's the mitochondria going to do? It's just going to crank out energy. Thousands of times more energy than we had in these prokaryotic cells. And so if it wasn't for the mitochondria and its energy-making ability, we wouldn't have eukaryotic cells, we wouldn't have a multicellular life, and we wouldn't have us. So is that trivia? Well, maybe. But it depends on how much you understand about the mitochondria, and I hope that was helpful. Thank you.